All right, so I've got confirmation that people can hear me. All right, thanks. We'll start again. Okay, it's weird because there's some sort of delay going on. This is, I'm gonna start again. All right, so welcome again to LNUG 93. I don't know if anyone's heard this before. Um, and I'm having a ball. Uh, if you could open a beer and have a sip for me, I've uh, got mine with me. Um, if you could, you've got a bit of homebrew and a cheese toasty in replacement for the pizza. Um, very pleased to have you all along. I hope you're all safe and healthy and you and your families are all healthy and uh, are all safe too. Um, uh, welcome to uh, Bernard and Thomas tonight. And I'm having a ball. We're talking us through uh, hopefully, you could open a beer. Uh, what they've got to share authentication and serverless with Node and transactional emails at scale. Uh, interesting talks. Um, glad to see so many of you joined us. Uh, some important just housekeeping. The uh, I hope you know where your toilets are, just in case. Uh, you, uh, the, uh, you'll, you need to pop out. It's fine. Just make sure you're on mute. Uh, fire exits. I uh, hope you know where your fire exit is. Yeah, Wi-Fi. All the normal slides don't really apply tonight. Uh, but what does apply is our code of conduct. That still applies. Uh, we're dedicated to providing a harassment-free meetup experience for everyone, and we do not tolerate harassment of meetup participants. Participants uh in any form uh the code of conduct applies to all attendees online in this case uh speakers and organizers that's all of us at the monthly meetups um and related social events so online events and streaming included uh so uh if you want to read the full code of conduct you can go to our website lnog.org code of conduct there's a link near the bottom of the page um and you can tweet about what you're uh, experiencing now uh <laughs> what you or you can uh, contribute to the chat in YouTube. Uh, also, tweet me, mention me, add Mataz, and uh, I'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, right, uh, we have a Gitter channel, which is a little bit busy tonight than normal because everyone's remote. Uh, we've got a back channel where we're discussing how things are going, um, but there's also a uh, there's also a public channel I'll now discuss. Please join us there. Come and say hi, um, and uh, we can take it from there. Uh, or add your comments to the YouTube channel. Um, as we go through the, tonight, just um, add your questions if you have for the speakers to the uh, YouTube comments, and we can uh, collate what is there and put them to the speakers at the end uh, rather than interrupting the talks with anything. So um, without further ado, oh, great. While we're on the Gitter thing, we've got a jobs channel and we will have a uh, jobs table. Uh, we will uh, break out to, uh, at the end of the two talks, we'll break out for a bit of social time uh, and we will have a jobs table there as well. But meanwhile, if you want to post anything in the Gitter channel, feel free to do that. Um, so normally Nearform would be providing us with the beer and the pizza, but they're not tonight because we're all providing our own, but they're a long-term sponsor. So thanks very much to them uh, as usual. And um, just a disclaimer, I work for Nearform. Uh, we're a remote first company. So this uh, feels like a normal working week for me. Um, the uh, pusher would normally be doing the video um, and they're a long term sponsor as well in terms of providing the video. Uh, Alex is usually here filming us or one of his uh, associates, uh, but tonight we've got uh, the pleasure of Kevin taking over the streaming responsibilities. Uh, but a big shout, big shout out to Pusher as normal. Um, I put a shout out earlier on Twitter for community announcements uh, and since then I've not actually checked Twitter. So uh, I will get back to this uh, in the break between speakers if necessary. Um, but if you have something to share, please just uh, send us send us a message on the uh, on the Gitter channel and or on Twitter, or at us at Twitter. Um, otherwise just, um, and we'll try and fit you in there. Uh, Bernard, I hope you don't go too far because it's just seen you've got up for your desk because I think you're next. Um, the, uh, the uh, if you have any feedback, um, there are lots of ways to contact us, um, but we do have a way that is uh, tracked on Gitter, so we can all invite feedback and commentary to that. We had a lot of uh, healthy feedback from our last, um, and advice for speakers at, from our last meetup, which I think 
uh, was all being taken on board, and we'll hopefully bring that into into the next uh, meetup, following meetups. Uh, again, get her again. Um, so before I launch into Bernard's talk, just to say we're always uh, open for talk proposals. Um, it, I don't know how long this uh, method of delivering talks is going to go on. Uh, we will get together as people in the same room at some point in the future. But meanwhile, if you're interested in giving a talk, uh, please uh, do fill out a proposal on our speakers repo and uh, we can get some feedback on that. Um, so on to the actual event that you've uh, come and joined us for. Uh, first up, we've got uh, I'm sorry about the uh, the HTML encoding on the <laughs> on the title, uh, Bernard. But it's authentication and serverless and Node. And um, I think just give us a couple of minutes while we switch over speakers. Uh, welcome and a big round of applause for Bernard. Um, so I will stop sharing. So on to the actual event that you've uh, come yeah. to us for. Uh, first up, we've got. Uh, I'm sorry about the. Uh, the HTML encoding on the <laughs> on the title, uh, Bernard, but it's authentication and serverless and Node. And um, I think just give us a couple of minutes while we switch over speakers. Uh, welcome and a big round of applause for Bernard. Um, so I will stop sharing. So on to the actual event that you've uh, come yeah. for. Uh, first up, we've got uh, I'm sorry about the uh, the HTML encoding. On the, on the title, uh, Bernard, but it's authentication and serverless and node. And um, I think just give us a couple of minutes while we switch over speakers. Uh, welcome and a big round of applause for Bernard. Um, so I will stop sharing. So on to the actual event that you've uh, come yeah. to for. Uh, first up, we've got, uh, sorry about the, uh, the HTML encoding. On the, on the title, uh, Bernard, but it's authentication. Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I've been given the thumbs up. Hi, everyone at Elnug. Hope you're all safe. This is Bernie. You can see me on BernieBear2000 on Twitter. And um, I'm here to do a presentation about authentication and serverless and Node. So just before we go into it, let's just have a little understanding about the three words that we've got on the screen. So we've got authentication, which is something more common with the username password. And then um, we've got serverless. Um, serverless is essentially a cloud-based technology which um, allows you to harness, you know, technology in a way that's um, future-proof. You know, it's on the cloud, it's distributed, it's um, blazing fast, you know, and um, when you work with something called like a serverless function, which is what we're going to talk about in this talk as well, and essentially it's like spinning up a very small process, which is very um, efficient and very economical you know, for people to use and work with. And Node, we all know that, that's um, something that you can program the back end with. And in the implementation that I've done, I've used Node and um, I'm doing authentication and I'm implementing serverless. So just a moment and then we'll get started. So here's a little introduction. So first of all, you may be looking at the screen and thinking, okay, I know that, www, World Wide Web. 
But actually, in this instance, in this context, it's what, where, when. And um, basically, we're going to be looking at um, points that are going to be addressed in this talk. So um, we're going to cover some history. And, um, you know, you can flag it and say history boring, but like, I find history incredibly interesting, especially if related to technology. And then we're going to look at a problem which needed to be solved. And then we're going to look at the solution. And then we're going to look at how to code it. And um, I'm not going to be doing any live coding, but I am going to be showing you resources and there'll be code snippets and examples. And this is presented on slides.com. If you've already come across slides.com, then I suggest you check it out. It's a great presentation tool for developers all around the world. So first of all, let's define authentication. So it's a Greek word. And it um, pretty much means to look at something as to say authenticus, and that's not how you pronounce it, but to say something is real or genuine. And um, being real or genuine from the authentus as being the author. But then if you look up a more recent definition of these words, then they differ somewhat. But at the um, time of writing, you know, the words as to be defined authentication is broken down into these words. So the next thing we're planning to do is to solve a common problem for developers everywhere, anywhere, all over the world, which is two things. And we're talking about accessing resources. So essentially, when you look at a resource, um, a resource could be a page available at a URI, which is the, um, the identifier or the URL, the location, and um, also API access. So essentially, when working with an API, you have protected resources and public resources and you can just understand them as being a function which can be called, which is publicly available, but then also a function which only can be called by somebody who has been granted access or has privilege to use that particular function. And when working in serverless, essentially, when you work with serverless, um, there's a difference between your standard HTTPS server and when you're working inside the handler of a serverless function. So not to go into too much detail just yet, we'll do that later. And if you have any questions, I can answer them then. But um, what we're going to look at also is um, SFA, which is um, single factor authentication, and then MFA, which is multi-factor authentication. So just to give you a quick idea of the common problem again, it was um, speeding up the login and authentication of a user, let's say for an e-commerce website. And um, when looking at um, single factor authentication, essentially that's knowing something, so a fact such as a password. But then when you address multi-factor authentication, it's knowing more than one piece of information. So essentially, when you log into your Gmail account or as such, you predominantly will approach it with the username and password. And then if you implement multi-factor authentication, they may send a code to your mobile phone or as a backup, which is essentially having something that you know, such as a password, or you know, for an ATM, a pin combination, code words, a secret handshake, you know, that sort of thing, thumbs up, fingers down, and um, anything that you can remember, and then you can type it in. And then also, when they do the multi-factor authentication and they send you a code, it's something that you have, which is your mobile phone in this instance. Or if you go a little bit further into the tech world, they have these, um, what are called portable USB like firmware, which are used for multi-factor authentication, which is something you have and only that person has that key. It's a bit like having Bitcoin on a USB stick and that sort of thing like that. So then um, the second part of the MFA includes um, physical objects such as keys, a smartphone or a USB drive, um, token devices, that sort of thing. And then there's another area of multi-factor authentication, which is um, something that you are. And um, that basically covers areas such as a fingerprint or a retina scan or facial recognition, which you all see currently available on, you know, new standard Android devices or iOS devices, that, that sort of thing. And also there's voice recognition. So now we're going to take a look at the history of authentication on the web. So 
if you don't know what a HT pass WD is, um, essentially that was something that was used a very long time ago, still in use today, to pretty much um, secure pages that are available on the web. And um, it'd be like a simple username and password. And then um, more into the future, as we say, the present day, which is something as a standard on most websites, is um, HTTPS, which essentially means you know having a SSL certificate, which basically authenticates that the server you know that you are making the request to has been listed registered and you know they're not you know necessarily a fraudulent you know business in that respect but you know we're not going to go deep into security and stuff like that but that's what we're talking about with https then you have the oauth and um oauth is essentially an implementation and a protocol um whereby you know security is implemented in many different ways and um you have jwt and um, JWT is, relates and is understood as a JSON web token. And um, we'll look into more of that in a little bit. So first off, we're going to hit the HTPAWSWD. And um, a little bit of the history on this. Um, it's pretty much used to create and update a flat file. And a flat file is essentially a text file database. So if you've ever done like a CSV export from a database, that's a flat file database. And then you can read and write into those, like you can read a value, then you can register the tab or the space and a new line, and you can read your records and you can pipe it and do all sorts of things on the command line with it. And um, you use it to store usernames and passwords, and it's for basic authentication on a HTTP connection in that respect. Um, what we're looking at here where you see bcrypt, um, essentially um, bcrypt is a encryption algorithm and um, it's based on the Blowfish cipher. And if you want to know what that is, then I suggest you grab hold of your keyboard, type it in, quickly look it up and get a definition. And um, essentially, um, this algorithm is described in four simple steps, whereby you pretty much take a chunk of the password, you then run a logical operation against it and then once you've done that you then swap it onto the other side and you sort of repeat the whole process it gets really messy and then you have a really heavily encrypted you know um piece of information and that's the easiest way to understand it if you do want to look more into encryption then um there are different resources available on the web and um, if you don't understand what x or means then essentially i believe that means exclusive or which is basically when you have like bit data, such as zeros and ones, it's sort of like swapping the values. You know, so if it's a zero, it becomes a one. If it's a one, it becomes a zero. Then if you have like eight of those, take four of them, swap them over to the right-hand side, do the whole process again, jumble up again, then you have a encryption layer. And um, that level of encryption is sufficient in many cases, which was um, needed by HT Pass WD. So a little bit of history on JWT. So um, JSON Web Tokens is essentially um, taken the JSON format and then you take a payload of information and um, the payload of information consists of what you see on the screen on the right hand side on the encoded where you have the header and um, that includes the algorithm and the type of you know um, information that's being passed such as JWT. You also have the payload and um, when working with authentication Essentially, the payload contains information such as the sub um, and um, the name and the IAT. And um, these pieces of information relate to the ID for the person, such as the subscriber or the name of the person or the time the, tish, uh, the, time the token was issued at. So I believe that IAT is the issued at time. And then you have the token verification signature, which is in the blue underneath. And then obviously, and then some implementations you can see in black, you have your 256-bit secret that gets encoded. encoded. And um, the whole point of like bringing across something such as JWT was essentially to have a uniform way that a authoritative server could authorize somebody to do something such as logging into a website. And then they basically wanted something that was interoperable and they wanted a standard that could be measured. And also as well as that, um, working with JSON is pretty much the way forward for data interchange on the web, especially when working with JavaScript and various other languages. Um, for instance, Facebook, um, they recently 
um, announced um, the relaunch and the reprogramming of their messenger application for iOS. And then they use JSON heavily in that and um, with the database to like have feature um, flags and um, different types of um, database um, schemas that need to be used, like flags for what features need to be used, all that sort of stuff. And it's really interesting. And if you want a link to it, I can send you one after the talk. So um, now we're going to look at OAuth, and then we're going to quickly glide through this, and I'm going to move on to the implementation and um, the solution and the problem. Um, you know, we're going to get away from the history. So um, pretty much this um, diagram that you're looking at here has a series of steps, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And essentially what those do is that it makes an authorization request for the resource owner, and then the authorization grant in step C goes to the authorization server, it returns a token, which is in step D, and then step E is where you use that access token to access something else on the resource server, such as an API call, and then F returns you the response from the protected resource or the protected resource being a file. But that's essentially the flow, and it's really that simple. One of the things that I want to do in this talk is I want to get through this as simply as possible. So now we've covered the history, we're going to move on to some of the more interesting parts. So. More recently, we're looking at passwordless. So passwordless authentication is essentially a type of authentication where you don't have to remember your username and your password. You essentially just need access to something that you already have set up with multi-factor authentication as such. And um, some people might say, well, what if you lose access to your email? Then there's the backup and you can get hold of that. What if someone gains access to your account? Well, then you, know, you do take precautions against that sort of thing. So now we're gonna move on to something else. So we've got a use case problem and we want to quickly and securely provide an access to resources in a website and an API. So essentially, like, how can you go about do, doing that? And like, how can you break this statement down into something more tangible, such as a feature that needs to be programmed in Node or JavaScript or C or any other language, Python, for instance? So we want to look at logging into a website. So essentially, when you log into a website, you may come across it and you say, well, how do I log in or how do I access a feature? So to give an example of this, I'm going to take you to a site and then I'm going to pipe in something and um, it's a public facing site and then you basically want to do something or perform an action. And then in order to do something or perform that action, essentially what you need to do is that you need to be logged in. So for instance, we want to go in here, we want to buy this pair of cool trainers and we want to buy it. So we try that, but it's asking you to log in. And the reason it's asking you to log in is because you're not an authenticated user. So now we're gonna have a quick brief understanding of securing an API endpoint. So an API endpoint, for instance, that need to be secured is just basically a protected function. So then essentially we're thinking like, well, how and why would I protect the function? Well, in some cases when working with serverless, that's something you need to do. So now we're going to quickly cover the solution. So passwordless authentication. And in this, you can refer to OpenID Connect and the JWT RFC. So Open Connect is essentially a protocol which um, layers on top of the OAuth 2.0 protocol, and it's the um, identity layer. And um, what it does is that um, it allows you to verify an end user based on some authentication method. And a lot of security platforms that use this and the one I use in this particular presentation implement that. So then if you look at the JWT RFC, and if you've never come across an RFC, I suggest you do. They're incredibly interesting to read. And um, what they do is they outline the specification for any piece of technology. So if you want to learn about HTTPS and you want the whole geeky version of it, then go check out the HTTPS RFC, or for instance, the JWT RFC. So now we're going to take a quick look at Auth0 passwordless. Auth0 passwordless is basically an implementation of the technologies and standards that have been briefly described in this presentation and allow you to log in without using passwords. It's easy and secure. If you want to learn more about it, I suggest you go to authorio.com forward slash passwordless.
Now we're going to look at the implementation and how it's done. Now, we're going to skip over the boring bit, reading the documentation, which is what a lot of us don't do, read the documentation, which is I suggest everything that they do and you do is to read the documentation first. But we're going to jump straight into the code and look at the examples. And we're going to look at a diagram, for instance, and just so we can have an understanding of it. Okay, so apologies for that. It appears that we have a slight issue with the diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and hack the site. And there we go. So what we're looking at here is that this is a, a diagram of the auth0 passwordless authentication flow. The user basically enters a code, the application, calls a passwordless API, auth zero authenticates it returns back to the user you redirect them to the protective resource or reload the page that sort of thing so now we're going to look at a couple of examples and i'm going to run through the code and then i'm going to sum things up for you so we've got a couple of simple examples html jss got a react js and a netlify serverless function so here's an example of the auth zero passwordless authentication flow, how to get it set up. Essentially, you just need a button, which can have any ID. You call in their script, and then you have a JavaScript um, tag in the page. And um, then you just pretty much implement passing your client ID and your domain. These are details that you get from your Auth0 account. And then you click the button and you show the dialogue. And then Auth0 takes everything you know over from there and takes care of everything. So now we're going to look at a React.js example. So this is, again, JavaScript. And um, if you don't understand this, um, then I can talk to you about it after. But essentially, this is just um, JavaScript. It's React. It's um, ES6. Uh, you have hooks um, for state, that sort of thing. And um, this basically covers how to initialize the lock implementation, passing to it variables for configuration and also how to store the access token and different actions that you would need to take. So now we're going to take a look at the serverless function. Now, when you're working with serverless and you're working with Node, essentially this is the nuts and bolts of how you will handle it on a Node server if you're not using Express and we're working with serverless. So then when you look at the Auth0 implementation, essentially what they're looking at is that they provide you with an Auth0 package. But then what you really need is a couple of packages inside that library. So you need the JSON web token library and you need the JWKS-RSA library. And if you look here, there's a link to netlify.com for functions and the handler method. And that basically explains to you a little bit more about writing serverless functions. And essentially what Netlify have done is they've taken AWS Lambda and they've packaged it up and made it simple, easy to use and scalable and just very effective and cost effective and efficient. So what we're looking at here is that we have a serverless function and we're basically going into the serverless function. We are accessing the token. And then once we've accessed the token, we are setting up the options. We provide an audience and the algorithm. And um, the algorithm that we're providing here is a public and private key 256-bit um, algorithm for the handshake for authentication. And then you need to provide your well-known JSON token web keys. And then that's how they validate it. You also need to be able to get hold of the keys. You need to be able to verify the token. And you need to basically respond back to your calling application with a response. And you can see the different status codes, as you can see there, the 200 and everything's OK. And if there's an error and 
you name it if you want to pass back data. Essentially, what you're looking at here for this implementation is this is an authentication layer. So pretty much what would happen here is this is simply verifying that the token has been issued from an authoritative server and you're checking it by verifying it. Now, now that we've covered all of those things and you've seen the implementation of it and just how easy it is, I'm just going to ask you, which is pretty much what everybody would like right now, is to say, do you fancy a takeaway? So here's your takeaway. No? Um, it's quick and easy to implement. It's reliable and broadly adopted, and it has a great level of community support. So if you do want to get started with Auth0, if you do want to get started with serverless, if you want to get started with passwordless authentication, or your regular traditional database authentication using a username and password, and you don't want to manage sessions, manage access keys, manage users, manage passwords, then this is a solution for you. Remember, the problem was quickly and effectively logging into an application, website, or accessing a resource. And the solution, in many cases, is to use a global technology provider set standard such as Auth0 and another one such as Serverless, which is growing in the community if you don't already know it. And um, those resources are available there. And you can see the Auth0 link and the Netlify link. And if you need access to the slides, then I can provide them to you as well. So thanks very much. Oh, and um, just to um, give you a better idea of how this works, I thought I'd just jump on with this. So just bear with me a moment. So um, we're looking at, um, you've seen the code, you've seen it all work, but let's see it in practice, okay? So then you go to this one, um, this website, and you've typed in what you're looking for, and it's now telling you that you need to log in. And then you're saying, well, okay, so let's log in. So essentially, we're going to go here, we're going to click this button, and um, it's going to say, you know, provide your password. Now what's happened is that um, the authentication layer is pretty much asking you for the code. So we're going to go to the, um, our email, which we have multi-factor authentication enabled for, and we're going to ask it, you know, um, what's the code? And then we're going to say, how can I like get that and like provide it back to the client-facing site? And then what can I do? So now here's the UK on the site, which is that it's a public-facing site. You don't need to create an account to use it, but you do need to authorize a transaction and there needs to be a record of that and that needs to be used for like marketing purposes for the people and the vendors who are selling items and that sort of thing so now we've done that we just come in back to the website we hit the submit button and it logs us back in and then we're back on the site and then you can go back look, see what you were looking for and um you know as this is a site in development which you can see from the local host um i'm going to basically add a token to reload the product when it comes back from the redirect url but essentially, what we're looking at now is that you can purchase that item. And um, what that is, is a solution to the problem, which was a quick and easy method of authenticating somebody reliably and securely, and then providing access to a protected function on a serverless API, which basically is that after you purchase this and you hit the button to pay for it, then a record of transaction gets issued to the database. And that is pretty much covered and securely done via the API and the protected function implemented with Netlify. So thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk.
Right. Thank you, Bernard. Big round of applause from all of us at Elnug. And um, really appreciate the value of what you're offering us uh, or what you're sharing with us around authentication. I think it's something that's difficult to get our heads around. If anyone's got any questions, please uh, be sure to share them in the channel on the YouTube channel. There's a chat there. Uh, in case you didn't notice, there's a few old friends uh, catching up there who haven't seen each other in years, which is great. But also amongst that, let's uh, get some questions going. And then uh, we've got some people who will pick them out and we'll ask, uh, ask Bernard uh, at the end of the proceedings. So let's move straight on. Let's not waste any time. Um, and just to, just to say, uh, just to remind you that we'll be uh, publishing a link to a uh, uh, a social area afterwards where we can break off into groups and join tables and talk about getting jobs or talk about um, anything you want. We have, I think there are four tables we've got set up for different topics. Um, and I think Bernard will be in one of them. And if you want to ask him directly about anything that he's uh, spoken about tonight, uh, you can you'll be able to do it there as well. So without uh, any further ado, on to Thomas. Uh, Shuffling, another a big common challenge we've had authentication and now we've got emails we're covering the most difficult gnarly problems in web development uh, tonight and uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk it sounds like an amazing uh, thing that he's pulled off with the technical uh, prowess and uh, you know just tackling email in itself is a difficult thing so let's hear what he's got to share with us and um, thanks Thanks everyone for uh, your ongoing comments in the in the channel. I, I wish I could hear you all applauding. Hey there. Um, hi guys. Thanks so much for having me. And big shout out to the Alnog organizers, first of all, for organizing this in these strange times. Um, I'm Thomas. Um, I am 23, I'm Dutch. I started my first startup when I was 15, um, which was an e-learning platform that I sold to my own high school. Uh, since then, I've created some other companies, the most recent one uh, being Near Street, a company that helps local shops um, to show their livestock on Google, so that you can just Google a shop name and see if the corner store around the corner is still stocks toilet paper or some better use of that technology um let's go to the slides if you don't mind kevin um so what i'm going to talk about is transactional emails and how to manage those and scale them up um which might sound boring because out of experience i think that building systems that involve sending email aren't the most interesting. But hopefully I can give you some guidelines on how to make it a little less boring and give some tools that should really help uh, develop email systems next time you have to. So first off, I guess, um, let's quickly discuss what transactional emails entail. I guess all of you know, but let's, let's do it anyways. Um, so transactional emails are any type of emails that are sent automatically. So for example, whenever you try to get a new password, the reset link will send you an email um, or a monthly invoice or a welcome email for some platform that you just signed up for or um, a notification of some new content on a social network platform. Um, and these are usually HTML emails. And HTML is not the nicest for emails. Let's, for example, go to this MailChimp one for a second. Source code for that looks like this, which probably doesn't really spark joy. Um, it's actually, it turns out it's actually really hard to make emails look great um, across all the different email clients that exist, especially the slightly older ones like Outlook. Um, a lot of those email clients don't support a lot of the standards we're used to when uh, writing HTML and CSS for the modern web. Um, one of the most obvious things is 
these emails still use tables to do simple layouts, like centering the content in the middle of the email, uh, which is something we've not done on the web since like 2008. And if you would um, put in a pull request on GitHub with code like this, um, you can probably expect some rude comments from senior developers because it's just not acceptable. Unfortunately for email, it's the only way to go. One of the other things you might notice in this snippet is that almost every element has a style attribute. Um, unfortunately, a lot of email clients don't support separate style sheets, so you need to have them in line. And in general, all of this is not really manageable. You don't want to have code like this in your repository. It just doesn't look great, and it's really hard to maintain because finding some kind of sentence that you want to edit in here is just a nightmare. Luckily, there's a few um, solutions for that. One of my favorite ones being MJML, which is a standard developed by MailJet, a uh, email sending provider. It's a open source tool set um, that kind of provides you a HTML-like syntax um, and a whole lot of standard components to quickly build your emails. It looks something like this. That's already a lot more manageable. You'll notice all these MJ dash uh, components. And uh, it's it's pretty simple to get started with this. They have a really cool website that has a getting started uh, course, some free templates, and it also has an online editor with a live preview function so that you can build your emails and see what they look like. Um, you can even still use some of your own HTML and CSS in here if you want to, but you luckily almost never have to because their standard component set is quite extensive. Um, so this is a big set I had from just plain HTML templates, but it still requires a developer to look at it. It's not something that you could bomb off to your partnerships or marketing team uh, and ask them to make a simple change. So what I've started doing in some of my projects recently is splitting out email templates into two parts. One being the layout file, the general structure of the email with some styling, probably your logo at the top and some standard links at the bottom. And then keeping the email, the actual email content separate in a markdown file. Um, you probably are all familiar with markdown. It's what we used to uh, write our readmes on GitHub. Um, what's slightly different about these um, markdown templates is that there's two uh, specific technologies used, namely the addition of front matter, the red stuff at the top, and a templating language called Twig to add variables. Um, that front matter at the top allows us to set some standard uh, metadata about the email. So in this example, it defines that the standard uh, or the default um, layout MGML file should be used and what the subject is and what the inbox preview is. And then you'll see that there's um, these merge tags in Twig. Twig is kind of like um, handlebars or mustache. So it allows you to really easily embed dynamic content in your email and even do things like if and else statements if you need to conditionally show some content. Um, recently, I, I've built a pipeline around these few technologies quite often for startups. And recently, I got kind of fed up with that and realized uh, I should just build an open source tooling library that encompasses all of these. Um, so what I've built is a library called Macaw that does a few things. Namely, it contains a Node.js library to parse these templates with the separate layout and content files and simply send them. Um, it also contains an in-browser preview tool that will show you what emails look like while you're editing them and a command line utility that helps you set up your project with these email templates. So to get started with that, you simply run mpx macaw in it. mpx is the um, executable tool from npm. Uh, it will just download the package and immediately run it. So if you run this um, in your project, it will create an email directory, it will add some templates, and it will add macaw as a dependency to your package.json file. And what you're left with is a structure like this. 
um, an email directory with some plain text markdown files in there, and then the subdirectory with your layout files. Um, what's cool is that you can then just run Macar preview and it will open your web browser with a preview of your email templates that you can edit while uh, seeing what they look like. So this is what that tool looks like. You can choose your template, um, choose between a few different preview modes to see what your email would look like on mobile and set some bars that the template needs to uh, be filled out. Um, the next part is, I mentioned that Macaw also allows you to send the email um, through different types of providers. And the code that you need for that is actually pretty short. Um, you simply require or import Macaw and then one of the uh, providers that it comes along with. Um, so for example, Stendgrid is my preferred email sending provider usually. Um, you simply create an instance of Macaw and then um, set that provider. You can optionally uh, set a different directory if you don't want to go with the standard structure of having an email directory in your root. Um, then you load in the template, monthly newsletter in this case, and specify some bars. And then you simply call uh, the send method on the template and it will use the provider you specify to send it off. There's a lot of optional parameters, but the only thing that's required is a to address. Like I mentioned, it's possible to switch out SendGrid for another provider. Currently, I only support SendGrid and Amazon's simple email service, but it should be easy enough to build um, your own adapter for your preferred email provider. Uh, so what I thought might be fun is to talk about how we use this in production at Near Street. Um, short answer is that we currently don't because we use a um, very old and way less structured version of it. But hopefully we can switch to actually using Macaw pretty soon. Um, Near Street is built completely using serverless technologies. And the email service is a perfect example of um, splitting things up into separate functions because the email service is just one lambda that accepts a few parameters, namely the user ID, a template name, and then some VARs, um, and it sends up the emails. Um, in our use case, we basically only ever send emails to users that we already know. So instead of sending, uh, passing along a um, email address, it's easier to just pass along a user ID. And then that function retrieves that user's data from the database, most importantly, name and email. But in our case, users are shops. So we also retrieve the shop name and things like the address so that they are available as standard VARs to be used in templates. And then something else we do is we log whenever we send an email to a user. Most uh, providers already do that out of the box. For example, SendGrid has a great dashboard where you can see um, the history of the emails you've sent, but storing it ourselves allows us to show um, a full history of the communication we've had with a specific user without having to query SendGrid for that. Uh, and it allows us to do something else that I think is pretty fun that I custom built for Near Street, which is um, forcing some emails to only be sent once. For example, a welcome to the platform email should never be sent more than once during the lifetime of a customer. So for those, I've added something in the markdown where you can specify that it's one of those emails by just simply setting the parameter once to true in the markdown from matter. And if the Lambda um, sees such a uh, template, it will first check in the database if we've not already sent that email to the user. And if you have, we'll output an error instead of sending the email. Um, to kind of talk slightly about the world of serverless that Bernard was just talking about, um, we trigger those emails mainly based on DynamoDB event streams. So for example, um, when a shop ends their trial on a platform, 
the only thing the front end does is it does a call to update a row in DynamoDB, setting a trial end date. And then DynamoDB automatically triggers a lambda that notices that that shop before didn't have a trend, uh, trial end date and now it does. So uh, it can send an email to the shop to tell them that the trial has ended. We do something similar with SNS topics. We have a data lake or rather a data puddle, I guess. Um, we're just getting started. Um, that stores a lot of different events. And instead of having to include um, the lo business logic of sending of notification based on some of those events on the application side, we can simply just create a new Lambda uh, hook that Lambda up to an SNS topic, subscribe to it, and then uh, based on the event type, send out a certain email. The cool thing about this is that it makes it very scalable if we ever decide to add new notification types or maybe even new ways of sending notifications. If we, for example, would want to start sending push notifications to users, that would probably just be a separate Lambda that listens to the same SNS topic or DynamoDB stream. Um, some some small practical tips around uh, scaling up your transactional emails. As soon as you start sending thousands, um, there's a few things you should take into account. One of them I already mentioned, which is make sure that you lock your emails somewhere. Um, in our case, that means that our partnerships team can easily see in a dashboard for each individual shop while emails they've received and when we were lost in touch with them. What might be helpful as well at some point is starting to use a custom IP. When you usually send emails through Amazon's uh, simple email service or through SendGrid, you'll share an IP address with a lot of other SendGrid customers. The disadvantage of that is that those customers could be sending spam and ISPs usually blacklist email servers based on IP address. So your emails might not end up with your customers because someone else on the platform is doing something malicious. A way of getting around that is um, purchasing a custom IP that's pretty cheap nowadays. Both SendGrid and Amazon SES offer it for less than $25 a month. Um, and then you're completely in control because your only emails sent from that IP address will be your own. One thing to keep in mind with that is um, that you need to warm your IP address, which means um, ISPs will get really suspicious if they suddenly see a new IP address starting to send thousands of emails a day, even though they didn't previously know about the email address. So slowly ramping up the number of emails you send um, might be a good thing. Both SendGrid and Amazon SES have tools to aid you in that. And if you have a custom IP address, you should also really keep an eye on your delivery and spam stats. Um, because if you're being flagged as spam, it's way easier for, your, for an ISP to block your specific IP and more customers will be impacted by that. Um, my last tip is um, MGML is a pretty good way of getting around most of the differences between email clients but it doesn't always produce 100% the same result for every email client. So if you want to be really sure, um, I would recommend using a tool like Litmus, which is kind of what, Litmus is kind of for email, what browser stack is for web pages, which means you simply insert some HTML in litmus.com and they will send you back screenshots of how that email looks in hundreds of different email clients on different devices. So that's a really helpful tool. Um, I'll just leave it with asking you to, if you have a project coming up where you have to send a lot of emails, maybe check out my library and I'd love to see what you think and how we can improve it. I think that's it. Thank you guys.
Okay. So thank you, Thomas. Great talk and an amazing sounding product. And uh, just from what I've been seeing in the chats, uh, really, really, uh, people are getting quite interested and excited about that. Um, so uh, well done. Thank you. And uh, yeah, support Near Street. Great, great, great uh, organization. Um, company doing interesting stuff to save the high street um long time uh, sort of supporters of uh Elmug. i often see them around and they also host uh, some of our workshop events sometimes during the year so um keep your eye out for them in your google searches and uh just wanted to give a last shout out uh so we are planning to meet again on the 22nd of april um which form it will take, we don't know yet, but I anticipate that we may be still meeting in this current form and maybe we'll iron out a few of the, uh, the glitches and the echoes between now and then. Um, and uh, I'll be also going, to, can someone from the moderators just post in the, in the, uh, the link to the uh, breakout rooms uh, so that we can all meet up and speak around the jobs table and other topic based tables um and see you there um so on uh, regarding next month we don't have any speakers lined up uh, currently so do put in a talk proposal on our um on our uh, repo speakers repo uh, welcome talks from all levels um and uh, if you've got an interesting idea or an interesting story to tell about your uh, experience with node or an open source project be very interested to to hear that um so have a great time and thanks to all our usual supporters uh we will be um yeah there's a there's a link in uh Thomas has just posted the link, cafe.lws.io slash hash slash lnug. Thanks all for joining us this evening and uh, see you in the rooms, in the breakout rooms, or see you next month, or see you in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. Take care and stay safe and stay at home. <laughs>